from the Jennings Communication Building on the campus of Dixie State University, this is Trailblazer Weekly, starring Carrick Sigmiller and Drayson Ball. It is Wednesday, and you know what that means. It is time for more Trailblazer Weekly Radio Only today. Coming at you live from the Radio Dixie 91.3 FM studios on the beautiful campus of Dixie State University in St. George, Utah. Carrick Segmiller, Drayson Ball with you on this Wednesday afternoon. Again, a radio-only version of Trailblazer Weekly. I guess we uh, we give the CEC folks the week off, Drayson, and, and let them recharge. And now yeah, I'm actually working on some other projects right now and uh, getting some work done and down in Las Vegas. So too much going on, though, to let this show slip by because we've got a ton to cover today and a great show coming at you Live from the Radio Dixie ninety one point three FM studio. Yeah, we're going to be packed. Even though we're radio only, it doesn't. Uh, we we don't we don't take the week off. We uh, continue to grind. We got a great show. We're going to be talking to Whitley Johns and Jill Bennett of the uh, women's soccer team who made a tremendous run in the uh, NCAA Division two uh, championship tournament. And obviously, uh, we're going to have a chat with them and see just exactly how how they were able to accomplish uh, those those uh, those feats and those wins. In, uh, in that tournament. Plus, we're going to have Tyler Allman on the show who uh, just received a, uh, a great award and a great nomination. And uh, so we got a packed show today. It's going to be great. Yeah, Dixie State uh, defensive coordinator, football team, uh, named the AFCA 35 under 35 Coaches uh, Leadership Institute. Huge honor for him in this Dixie State football program. He'll get to go back to Nashville, Tennessee, as part of the AFCA convention next month and uh, you know be part of a, a committee that uh, is... Pretty exclusive, 35 under 35, and and uh, we'll ask him about that coming up, what exactly that entails, uh, what things he's looking to bring back to, to help his program, and how he wants to get better as a coach. So uh, a lot to get to today. The, the men's basketball team is 8-0, 3-0 in the RMAC, uh, and they've broken the top 10 in the NABC, the National Association of Basketball Coaches, the Division II poll, which is the official poll. Of the top 25, there's a couple different versions. The NABC poll is your official top 25 uh, poll for NCAA Division II basketball, and the Trailblazers in the top 10 at number nine. The women's basketball team six and three overall slipped up against South Dakota Mines Friday night. They'd like to have that game back, but uh, onward and upward. So you got two basketball teams that uh, at at this point in the season are combined 14 and three. I think you take that and you run with it, and and we'll talk about both coming up a, a little bit later on the show. So a lot of good stuff to get to today, uh, live in the Radio Dixie ninety one point three FM studio. We might even let Martin Kelly say hi a time or two. Martin, how's it, how's it going on the other side? I can barely see you. I'm looking over these big computer monitors, but uh, how, how's it going? I'm good, man. I'm good. Just having some fun. Um, Christmas break's coming up. School's out. I got one more final to go. And you know what? I'm having fun on Trailblazer Weekly. Just rocking and rolling on Trailblazer Weekly. Martin uh, hangs out with us a lot in the Radio Dixie 913 studio during games. During uh, the Trailblazer Weekly show, when we're over in the CEC, he gets us TV on the studios. air every week. He gets us on the air every week. So this is uh, we did a radio show at the end of last year. If you remember, we had coach head coach Brad Sutterfield on the men's golf team. Uh, of course, Martin was here to help us with that one. Uh, and, and so he, he's he's the man behind the mask, if you will. Yeah, uh, he's hiding in in the background. We got to let him say hi. One of the unspoken every once heroes in a while. of the show. But every we in works is a, just a, like a national regular sports talk show or a podcast uh, to where we can all get on and, and just go crazy over regular sports. And I know I, I've heard like Martin's got some wild outlandish sports opinions, sports opinions. So, and he knows his stuff. So we, we, we got to get. We have a few minutes here. We have a few minutes to cover something. Well, it is Trailblazer Weekly. So I think we're going to keep it. Uh, we're going to keep it. Uh, Trailblazer Athletics, although I will say, cancel baseball. Garrett Cole signed with the Yankees. So, we do have a podcast studio here in the Radio Dixon 91.3 headquarters here in the station at the Jennings building. So, whenever you guys want to do it, let's do an hour and a half. I have, I'll be more than happy to have, I'll be more than happy to have some fun battling Drayson because he really just like he knows a little bit. I know a little bit more about him, but I'll be happy to have a little battles with him on the air. <laughs> Fair enough. Any response to that? Uh, Jason, I'll just let my, I'll just let my, I'll, I'll take the upper, the higher just, road on this. Just one. let so, your game, you just let your game do the talking. My game do the talking. <laughs> Trailblazer women's soccer team uh, accomplished a pretty amazing feat, and as Jason uh, teased a few minutes ago, we're going to have uh, Whitley Johns and and Jill Bennett, two of the huge parts 
of the the Trailblazers' recent run in the NCAA tournament. Obviously, it's a whole team sport. You had Adele, Adele Brown in, in goal, and Miss Sean Estridge was, came up huge uh, the very first Friday night on that cold, snowy night in Colorado Springs, came up huge in the penalty kicks. Uh, it, it's a team sport. Everybody contributed, but uh, Whitley John scored in in each of the game, each of the three games that the Trailblazers won. Uh, Jill, uh, Jill Bennett had a couple of goals and some assists through there as well, and and was all over the field. And so we've brought them in today, and we'll talk to them next. But what a huge, extraordinary thing that this Trailblazer women's soccer team was able to accomplish. South Central Region title. They actually bring home some hardware, a nice trophy, uh, meaning it's the long and short of it. Sounds exactly what it, what it. It's exactly what it sounds like. The Trailblazers were the last team standing in the South Central Region. Didn't win the Armac, the the regular season or the tournament, but it got into the NCAA tournament. Won three matches all on the road, including defeating the number one team in the country, UC Colorado Springs, on its home field in front of a, a raucous home crowd. And then ran into, uh, I've even heard Coach Gullis use this word, so I'll use it here. They ran into a buzzsaw in Western Washington, which quite quite frankly, if you look at their last three years, they in 2016, they were the national champions. Uh, and then they've had a few other trips to the Final Four sprinkled in uh, in this. in this. So the seniors on this Western Washington squad have either won a national championship or been to the Elite Eight of the Final Four every year. Yeah, just a, a, a buzzsaw. So I there's mean, no shame in losing to Western Washington uh, in, in the, the Elite Eight in yeah. the national quarterfinals. I mean, no doubt about it. I mean, up to that point, Dixie State had had really controlled the tournament. I mean, they they played UCCS, and, and that one was a really big win, and won that one two to one, and controlled much of the tempo in that one against Dallas Baptist. I mean, they just put the clamps on defensively throughout the entire game against Dallas Baptist. They dominated. I'll say it. They dominated the oh, number yeah. nine team in the start country to from start to finish. It was it was almost as if it was never in doubt. The Trailblazers got uh, an early goal by Whitley Johns. In fact, both Whitley Johns and Jill Bennett scored in that game. We'll have that on them on in a few minutes. Um, th- in fact, against Dallas Baptist, they had more shots on goal than Dallas Baptist had total shots. I mean, that's how uh, dominant a victory it was for Dixie State. Uh, Dallas Baptist's only goal came in the 89th minute with literally about a minute and three seconds to go before the end of the game. And it was on like a fluke. It was a weird, I don't think I've ever seen it before, a weird free kick that was not a goal, not a, not a penalty kick. It was a free kick inside, like almost inside the goalie's box. I mean, it was like it was almost inside the six yard box. It was four yards almost away, yeah, from from the goal, and so you almost knew they were going to score because you kick it in and then it can rebound. I mean, Dixie State had their entire team lining the goal <laughs> line like before the goal. I mean, it was crazy. So it was kind of a weird goal, but for the most part, it was a it was, it was two nothing shutout. Basically, it was a minute the entire left game within the match. Yeah, a minute when three Dallas Baptist left. scored. Um, I like to mention Jill Bennett and Willie Johns both scored in that game against Western Washington. I mean, I don't want to say this in disrespect to Dixie State because they did play well the entire tournament, but it almost seemed like Western Washington was playing with more players on the field than Dixie State. They were just extremely aggressive. They were going after the ball. They were not letting Dixie State pass or really even control the ball in their own half. And and that's kind of what he's mentioned. It was a buzzsaw and a very experienced Western Washington team that that defeated them. When you also think about... Where this Dixie State team had been, uh, you you go to the Armac tournament in um, was it uh, Golden, Colorado, right? Right. And and you lose in, in a heartbreaker there. So you're traveling that weekend. Then you travel to UC Colorado Springs in Colorado Springs, Colorado. And then most of the players, you know, at least got to go home for a minute and see family on Thanksgiving for a day or two. So you're traveling there, and then you travel again. Up to Bellingham, so four weekends in a row. There's some sort of travel. I mean, honestly, I think you can say. I think the team was a little gassed when uh, when they took on Western Washington, and that was their home and, field. And, as and well. it was their home field. So, and Western Washington had to go on the road in, in the first rounds, but uh, they're playing on their home field. A, a great team in Western Washington, and, and you know, and Dixie State was you know not quite able to do what they wanted to do. Western Washington came out and executed their game plan perfectly. But what a season! It was for for Dixie State, and what a tournament! I mean, it, it, you felt like there was no other way to start it really than than winning on PKs over Texas Women's after losing in the in the RMAC quarterfinals on on PKs. You kind of like got that monkey off your back and 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 got rid of that, and then played a, a very 
pretty dominating performance against UCCS. Dominated the first few minutes until they scored. That kind of woke UCCS up. And, and then it kind of shared pose- possession. Uh, Trailblazers took advantage of a miscue by the UCCS goalkeeper early second half. And then the defense sat back and did its job and, and won that game 2-1. to one. And, and, and then, of course, 2-1 to one victory over Dallas Baptist. Just incredible. And you're the South Central Region champions. You, you bring home the trophy. And uh, we've got Whitley Johns and Jill Bennett waiting to join us next on the show. We probably didn't take too much more time here because we want to hear from them, yeah. hear their experiences. And so well, let's do it. A great send out though yeah, for the Rocky a, Mountain Athletic oh, Conference last absolutely. game, last season, and, and a great send off. And I think they accomplished uh, much more than they ever would have thought and uh, went out with a bang in Division Two. Absolutely. Let's take our first break inside Trailblazer Weekly. When we come back, we will have those women's soccer players on Whitley Johns, Jill Bennett, two key cogs in the Dixie State attack in the NCAA tournament. Coming up next on Trailblazer Weekly. Welcome back inside Trailblazer Weekly on a Wednesday afternoon. Live from the Radio Dixie 91.3 FM studios. Not in our regular CEC TV studios today, but we are radio only. And we are excited about the guests we bring on to the show here for this segment. And we're going to have them in the next 20, 25 minutes or so. And just enjoy this because we've been enjoying this women's soccer NCAA tournament run for quite some time now. We've got joining us uh, Whitley Johns and Jill Bennett on the show. Two of the key parts of this Dixie State team and this Dixie State NCAA tournament run through uh, those three matches, those three wins, and then and falling to Western Washington and in the Elite Eight. Uh, ladies, thanks so much for, for stopping by the studio today and, and being part of our show. Yeah, thanks, thanks for having, having us. us. <laughs> it's, uh, cannot overstate how exciting it was. I got to take one of the trips and, uh, and be there in Colorado Springs myself and then was able to watch from afar the second time around, but cannot overstate just how exciting it was to watch you all go on this run and, and to win win these games. I'm sure you you weren't surprised at all. I'm sure you, you knew your team had it in you all along. But uh, Whitley, let, let, let's start with you. And just when you think back over those three matches, well, we can go even go back even further. We can go back to the quarterfinal loss in the RMAC tournament, and you're sitting there thinking, man, this, this could be it. Like, are we going to get a chance to play again this year? And then you get in, and then you you just go and win the, the South Central Region title. So I, I know it's probably hard to summarize uh, that two or three week span in just a couple of minutes, but what what's the first thing that, that comes to your mind when you think about what you and your team just went through the last couple of weeks? Um, I think it was just a roller coaster of emotions from, we hit like some pretty low lows when we lost that um, quarterfinal game against Metro and then, um, and then just realizing that we were in the tournament was just a big accomplishment for us all. Um, in a, in it of itself, and then to make it all, all the way to the Elite Eight, and um, I think we did honestly surprise ourselves. Just keep winning, and especially um, against some really really good teams. So it was just roller coaster, definitely. Um, but it was yeah, it was a good way to end the season. What's going through your mind when you just came off of, of a PK's match a, against Colorado School of Mines in the or was it? It was Mines, right? Uh, oh no, it was Metro. 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 Oh, yeah, yeah. Mines. yeah. Uh, I knew that. Uh, that's why you're here. Keep, yeah. me, keep me straight. Uh, so you've just lost in PKs, and then you're playing Texas Women's at UCCS. The final couple minutes are winding down, and you got to go to PKs again. What, what's going through your mind there? And thinking, seriously, like we, we have to end every match in, in PKs. What's going through your mind as the last minutes tick off, and you know that it's going to come down to PKs again? Um, it just kind of felt like deja vu pretty much. Um, we'd have a lot of ties that season, so, um, really wasn't too big of a surprise, but, um, I think you could definitely feel the difference, um, in that match against Texas women's because, um, we want, I think we wanted it more. I know obviously the RMAC championship is a huge accomplishment too, but now that we're in the NCAA tournament, it was like, you could feel all of us just determined to get to that next round and kind of redeem ourselves redeem ourselves from losing against um Colorado Springs in the regular season. So 
Jill, let's, let's bring you in and, and mm-hmm. get your kind of thoughts. And, and obviously, you know, you were a, a huge part of this run, obviously, beyond the team and, and, and being the, the player that you are. Let's go now. You've, you've defeated Texas women's in, in, the, in, the, in the penalty kicks and kind of fittingly. Um, you won 4-3 against Texas women's and you, after having lost 4-3 in PKs against, uh, against Metro. And then you go in and face the number one team in the country, uh, a team that you lost to earlier in the season. Had to have felt good to kind of get redemption against those guys. Is it just talk to us a little bit about what that game was like and and obviously winning that game had to have felt special for you guys yeah that game felt really special i think a big part of that was we had played them before played springs before and we weren't scared going into that game i think we had this uh newfound confidence in our team that we've had all season but it was you could just feel it throughout from every player and because springs is a really great team and i think we just came out there and it wasn't, I don't think it was the prettiest win we've ever had, but we dug it out and we wanted it more than I, like, you could just feel how much we wanted it and just, we pushed it out all the way to the end and we finished in regulation, which is a huge accomplishment for our yeah. team because we didn't want overtime, we didn't want PKs, we wanted to win that game. It was just a great feeling. And when when did it when did it settle in? I mean, was it was it and maybe it hasn't even settled in yet. Maybe maybe it was a right after the game. Was it on the trip home? I mean, you went in a team that had lost one match all season, and they I mean they dominated the regular season schedule. And I think they lost to Colorado School Mines in the RMAC tournament, and that was their their only loss to that point. And then of course you guys beat them in the second round there uh, of the, uh, the, the the South Central uh, tournament. Uh, but when did it settle in for you guys of like? We just beat the number one team in the country, a team that dominated everyone else they played up to this point. When did that settle in for you, and what was that like? Um, I think it hit, like, at the end of the game. I think all of us, like, we – I literally – I had never been so tired in my life, and after that happened, like, I couldn't even – I just dropped, and I was like, we did that. It was – like I think it hit right off the bat, and it was just like, a great feeling. Well, let's rewind. I can't believe I didn't lead with this because I think I'm still thawing out myself but uh, I think a big part of, of how tired everybody was <laughs> Sunday was everything you know the trip out the the first match Friday gets delayed what was it five hours mm-hmm. you know at, at the admin meeting Thursday afternoon the, the UCCS administrators were like yeah the weather says it it might snow an inch maybe we'll be fine and then it was snowed like a foot but, like yeah. it just dumped all day. All, day, <laughs> all day all night and all day and and they had to clear the field, which props to them. They they did a good job clearing the field. But uh, how cold was it really? I, I know for me, like I'm not moving around a lot. But how by the end of that match, I mean, are you even able to really move when you're getting set to take those PKs, Jill? I mean, let's start with you. Yeah. I mean, how cold do you notice the weather while you're playing and out there running? I mean, how cold was it Friday yeah. night against Texas Women's? In that very first NCAA tournament game, it was it was cold. Um, <laughs> to say it simply, um, I think I didn't think how cold it was, and then the national anthem was playing, and we weren't moving anymore. And I look at Whitley, I'm like, I can't feel my hands. And then the rest of the half, I was like, I can't feel them. <laughs> but we just kept running and just kept moving. I think that's why we were also so tired. Because I'm like, I'm not stopping. Because if I stop, I'm gonna freeze. Yeah. So it was cold. Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. Whit- Whitley, what, what about you? Anything to, anything to add there? That the coldest game that you've ever played in? Maybe oh, not. Yeah. Maybe. I, yes? No, totally. I, well, I'm from Arizona, so I haven't played in a lot of cold games, but that was the coldest game I have ever played in. I, I hate wearing gloves playing and like a lot of girls like wear gloves when they play and I had like a long sleeve for the first half and like the whole time I had my long sleeve wrapped around my hands because I was so cold. And then during halftime, I stole one of our teammates gloves. And then, yeah. And then even the next day, like I just remember feeling like my whole body was just exhausted because I feel like the whole time we were like so, survival mode. Yeah, we were in survival like, mode. What are you doing? And we were so <laughs> tense for such a long time that like when we finally got to relax, it was like, what just happened pretty much so <laughs> yeah yeah just to say it was cold i think was an understatement yeah. <laughs> I, I just remember when everyone first got off the bus i'm, I'm walking you know i've got my camera and i've got other things and i'm walking in and i say to somebody you know it doesn't feel it actually doesn't feel too bad out here you know that the, with the match started at six so that was yeah. what, like four four thirty that we're getting off the bus and then the sun goes all the way down and, and it gets dark and i'm thinking okay never mind 
it's it's cold and yeah. like I, I can't imagine having to run around. Well, we came back play. on the on the second half and like the turf was crunchy. Yeah, like, it was frozen, <laughs> yeah. and I was like, okay. Yeah, and the ball cool. was like ice. I don't yeah. know. So I got hit in the face with the ball, and I just, yeah, it yes. stung, and yes. I yeah. walked off. I was like, I can't feel it, but that that hurt really <laughs> bad. <laughs> yeah, of course. If we're talking about just that game still you know you know Adele Brown was huge in goal the whole time mm-hmm. but then of course you talk about having to come off the bench cold yeah literally cold Michonne Estridge comes in yeah, to killer. take the PKs mm-hmm. and she's you know running around going through her routine to get warm as she thinks that you know time's winding down I think we're going to go to PKs and she comes in and she gets what was it two stops yeah uh, no, I think so. in in the PKs yeah. to help you win that I mean how huge was was that to oh. be able to to, to win that game in PKs. Yeah, that's it was insanely huge. I think she's a huge reason why we made it as far as we did. And, yeah, that was amazing, especially as a freshman to step up in that high pressure. I think we all knew she had it in oh, her, yeah. though. Like, in practice, she knows all of our PK spots. Like, it's insane. Like, And even if she doesn't know, she's really good yeah. at gauging and yeah, She's amazing. So. Yeah. And Whitley, let's let's go back to you for just a second. Uh, you know, obviously, uh, another huge season for you after winning Armac Freshman of the Year last season, and, and you're just a sophomore, and it's hard to believe, just a sophomore because you, the way you play is just almost you know, as junior or senior at least. And, and another good season this year, 13 goals. Uh, you're tied for the lead. You were tied for the lead in goals in the in the Armac and. Uh, with Shannon Hopcraft from from UCCS, you did play three extra games, but she has more shots total on the season. So I think that kind of balances out uh, and, and kind of negates that. But just talk a little bit about kind of what you were able to do uh, throughout the entire season. It almost seemed like coming from last year, you had so many more goal scorers this year and you had so many more, I mean, a little bit more help, I guess. I don't know if that's a bad word thing to say, but you had a lot of different goal scorers. Did that seem to help you this season and open things up a little bit and allow you to have another successful year? Yeah, absolutely. Like it was, I had two completely different seasons from last year to this year. Um, Cause last year I was playing a completely different position. I was playing where Jill was playing and I was surprised to even get as many goals as I did um, playing because I'd never played wing in my like wing midfield in my life. So, um, but it was it was nice to come back um, to that central forward position because that's where I'd grown. Um, I think my whole life playing. Um, and then I think having Jill especially and then Sophie as well on the wing. I think it definitely it was a slow start because I was getting adjusted to it coming back to that position, but. Um, by the end of the season, and especially during the tournament, I think all three of us like clicked really well, and it was just, it was time to score, and so it was. I think it was a good time for us to catch our stride and get some goals. And then, and then this season, like we mentioned, uh, Jill, you as listed as a defender had six goals, even yourself. So, which is, it, that, and that's, that was what position there. Uh, yeah. And that's, and that's <laughs> exactly, and that's, and that's, and that's what I'm saying is that last year there was only two people with six goals, and Whitley was one of them. Yeah. And and this year there was there was four with at least six, and so yeah. that's what I was saying about how you know it seems like you had a lot more, a lot more, you know, diversity as far as goal scores like that. Yeah. How much did did you see it as a defender? of just being able to have many different options that you can go to try to get a goal. Yeah, um, I've never played defense. That was just a, <laughs> that just says it. But I love playing defense, so I'm glad I can do it. Um, but I think this uh, season, I think there's a lot of emphasis on uh, that uh, our coach had a lot of confidence in every player. And we had a lot of, uh, I think Whitley was, and we were fine sharing the glory in a sense. Like Whitley would passed me I'd finish I'd cross to her she'd finish like we were all happy for each other and I think there's just a different uh dynamic out there that I hadn't had for a long time in my career we're chatting with uh, Jill Bennett and Whitley Johns here on Trailblazer Weekly and just kind of continuing with that thing I think it was uh oh I used to watch a lot of Real Salt Lake I don't watch as much as I used to but uh you know the the glory years with Javier Morales and Kyle Kyle Beckerman and all those but they always used to say the team is the star and that kind of yeah. seemed like that was the 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 theme and the mantra with with this Dixie State women's soccer team this year. Let's talk uh, Dallas Baptist. Uh, you uh, you win the two games in Colorado Springs, and now now you're in the Sweet 16, and now there's a, an opportunity to go and 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 claim a trophy and claim a region title, and you know a long trip up to uh, to Bellingham, Washington, uh, to to play there. First couple of minutes of the game. <laughs> Dallas Baptist gets a great shot on frame, but 
there's Adele, as she has been all year, making that save. Did, did seeing, Whitley, let's start with you. Did seeing Adele make that save help everyone just kind of, okay, she's got our back, we're good? Is Was that kind of the, the yeah. thinking? And maybe everyone was fine before that. But it, I know for me, I was on the edge of my seat thinking, oh, they got a breakaway. She gets the save. And there's like, okay, we're going to be all right. Everything's going to be fine. Yeah. Um. Honestly, obviously, when you get a one, one-on-one with the keeper, that's always nerve-wracking, especially when you're just, I'm up on the forward position just watching it. Um. But I, I think a lot of us, I think all of us have so much confidence in Adele. She's made huge saves. Like, not just in the NCAA tournament, but in the RMAC, too. And she stepped up when she needed to. And so, yeah, that definitely, that save, I think, is kind of what pushed us into just dominating the rest of that game. Because that was, I know, obviously, we made lots of mistakes, um, but so did they. Um, But, yeah, that definitely, that definitely amped up our team to get that win. Jill, about 20 minutes later. You're able to find the back of the net, yeah. put the team up, one to nothing. Take us through, take us through that goal and, um, and kind of how that came to be and and the emotions of it all. Yeah, that goal is that goal is fun. <laughs> <laughs> I just remember that whole half. I just felt like I wasn't part of the game. I was like, I felt like I was moving, but the ball just wasn't coming to my side. And I just and our team was working so hard, and all of a sudden, I think a ball just comes through the middle. The def- defender takes a weird touch, and I just capitalize on capitalize on that and just uh, just in a moment of composure I just found the back of the net and I just remember just sprinting away and Whitley's kind of <laughs> trying to find me so they like hug me or whatever and I just ran away because I was just so excited because I think I knew once we scored that goal we weren't gonna we weren't gonna let this game slip yeah. away from us it was just a great feeling well, and then uh, mid second half Whitley uh, the insurance goal oh to make totally sure a two goal leads better than a one goal lead 60th oh, yeah. minute you're able to, to put the team up two to nothing. Take us through that goal and kind of run it back for us and, and tell us how it came to be. Um, that one kind of reminded me of kind of the same goal that I had against um, Colorado Springs because it was like um, Sophie did all the work beating those defenders on the outside, then gets stuck, and then all of a sudden the ball pops out to me, and it was just one of those things where I was in the right place at the right time. Um, but I even like. We, me and Jill were out at the same time, like in the second half, like a couple minutes later. And I just looked at her and I was like, two goals is great. I love a reassurance goal. <laughs> so, and it ended up that we needed yeah, that we reassurance needed it, goal. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it was just a really good feeling. And then just running to Sophie because really she just did all the work and I just happened to finish at the end. So, so we, I, we, the one thing we talked about in the first like, segment of the show was about that goal that Dallas Baptist scored in the 89th minute. It was, at least to us, just watching it on the stream, was a little strange because it was it was a free kick, but it was with almost inside the goalie box. So yeah. maybe and maybe Whitley, you weren't near, there down on that end, but maybe you were. I don't, what yeah, how like what we was were. maybe? <laughs> yeah, I guess you all lined up there on the goal line. What happened? What was the what was the ruling that that allowed them to get a free kick so close? It was just she did a high kick in the box, and so um, that's not technically it's it's supposed to be an indirect. Um, yeah, and it was an unintentional foul too. Yeah. And it was at a okay. weird angle that wasn't like a crazy scoring. Yeah, it, it was such so, a weird time. But yeah. so, so a foul not uh, grotesque enough. That's I don't know if that's the right word. Not <laughs> bad enough to to result in a penalty kick. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I'm sitting here thinking, oh, I thought it would just be I've a PK. I've never experienced but... that in my life. Like we practiced that at the beginning of the season. And I was like, weird. our coach yeah. Steve. I was like, why are we doing that? That never happens. Yeah. It, it was weird, <laughs> and it was like that last minute of. The, the whole game so it was just it was the whole thing was kind of weird but yeah. I, I remember like looking at Ambry and a couple of other girls and I was like we're fine even if they score this get it to the corner and we're gonna win we're gonna yeah. so yeah and, and it even seemed like you guys were maybe a little shocked yourself as to what to do because all of you lined up right on the right on the the goal line and you know obviously it was kind of a, a weird situation that, that resulted in, in that goal there but I mean for all intents and purposes a dominant victory and you guys really kind of clamped down defensively in the second half and really even throughout the entire game but especially in the second half they just were not able to get anything going how big of 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 that win was just your defense just it seemed like you guys had the ball in your half for a large, large portion of the game, and they were not able to get anything going. Just how, how much was that kind of influential? Yeah. No, our defense killed at that game. They were just locked in, connected the whole time. They Dallas Baptist, I will say Dallas Baptist, they 
could their counter was some of the fastest countering I'd ever seen and especially in playing division two and our defense they saw at the beginning in those first five minutes and then after that shut it down and we knew how to adjust and so they they really helped us that whole game yeah Willie Johns and Jill Bennett, two members of the Dixie State women's soccer team, joining us here on uh, Trailblazer Weekly, winding down in, in in the interview. I know it's 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 finals week. Hopefully, you finished most of your finals, if close to, if not all the way done, almost all the way done. We appreciate you oh, taking some time yeah. out of the, your busy schedule. I know that there's rather for a student athlete, there's never really a slow time. But uh, before we let you go, I just I just wanted to ask. It just seems like not only through this NCAA tournament, but all all season long. Um, if you can pull out these NCAA tournament games as good examples, because it seemed like uh, you were either, you know, in every game, both of you either scored a goal or had an assist or Jill, you assisted on a, on a, on a Whitley goal. It just seems like there's a connection there and, and in uh, a friendship, I can see the, the way you're talking now. And I just, I just talk about what it's been like playing alongside each other uh, up at that position and, and just wreaking havoc on, on opponents back line and and goalkeepers all you start with you Whitley um yeah I think me and Jill have always had a connection even since my freshman year when I was injured um and I couldn't play we we talked about like I can't wait to play with you like I think like we'll go really well together so I think um this year was like such a I don't want to say say special but kind of special year for us because we've wanted to play with each other like this for so long and it it finally came to be and especially like in those last like pressure games and stuff we really connected um so yeah i think yeah. we just no totally yeah. it was honestly like one of the the best seasons especially to play with whitley because we played together a lot last year but mm-hmm. last year i was kind of whitley's sub player <laughs> and so we were <laughs> yeah. really on the, you're the understudy. yeah i was the no. under no and in all honesty that's kind of how it was so we never got to build the same or have that going on the field so this year was just a blast like every time practice or anything i just like i gotta go play out with one of my best friends like i was like this is awesome yeah and it's like we we know we know each other and the way we play so well that it's like i pass the ball and i know jill's gonna be yeah. there and same thing with her like a I think a really good example was the um, Texas women's. Like, I saw her coming down, and I was like, "All right, I'm yeah. going in. I'm. I, I know even, she's gonna cross it." I didn't even need it. to look. I was like, "Whitley's gonna be on this line," and yeah. we just finished it. Yeah. And now you guys get to go do it and wreak havoc in Division One yeah. next year. Exactly. So yeah. it's gonna be it's gonna be fun to to see both of you guys go go and do that in Division One. Once again, congratulations! Uh, it was it was really fun for us to get to see you guys uh, go as far as you did. We were rooting for you uh, every step of the way, and it was just fun to fun to see the the success you guys had. Thank you. Willie Johns and Jill Bennett uh, joining us here on Trailblazer Weekly. Thanks so much. We got we to gotta run to a break, but uh, this women's soccer team, a, a team that uh, really you got to stop and think about uh, what it accomplished throughout the year. South Central Region champions uh, defeated the number one team in the country on its own home field and then knocked off what I believe was the last undefeated team in the country in Dallas Baptist. So, I mean, uh, big time performances by this women's soccer team throughout the the season. We got to take a break. When we come back, we're going to uh, head to the hardwood. We'll talk about uh, the men's basketball team, both the men's and the women's teams off to great starts this season. We'll talk about the men's team first and break down this 8 and 0 start, 3 and 0 in the RMAC and ranked number 9 in the country right now. That's coming up next after this break on Trailblazer Weekly. Trailblazer Weekly on a Wednesday afternoon. Uh, incredible interview with Jill Bennett and and Whitley Johns. Appreciate them coming in and and making making time to to be on the show, and and the only thing we lament about that interview is the fact that we couldn't get them on the CEC TV studio set. We love being here at Radio Dixie. We we do, but uh, that was an interview that needed to be on camera. But we couldn't wait um, until after the break. It just it was relevant now, and we and we had to do it. So congratulations to the women's soccer team on an incredible run, and congratulations to the men's basketball team off to. An outstanding start. 8-0 overall, 3-0 in the RMAC. And I just keep coming back. And we every every week we talk about this men's basketball team that's ranked ninth in the country, by the way, in the NABC poll. The Division II top 25. I just keep coming back to the fact that when last year ended, when, when Trailblazers lost to Mexico Highlands in the in the RMAC quarterfinals at home. And then a few months later we found out Matt Conway wasn't coming back. Found out Zach Frampton wasn't coming back. And there was a lot of question marks. And and we were saying to ourselves, okay, 
This is going to be an interesting year. This, this may very well be Coach Judkins' toughest or one of his toughest coaching jobs ever at Snow College or here at Dixie State. And they come out and they are 8-0. And I'll tell you, against Black Hill State Saturday night, they, they dominated they, they, on both ends of the floor. And that won't be the best team they play all year. But that's a team that, that wiped the floor. I mean, and I hate to say it that bluntly, but wiped the floor with Dixie State when the Trailblazers traveled out to South Dakota last year. So there was, there was a little unfinished business there. But uh, the Trailblazers were spectacular on the offense and the defensive end of, this, of, of the game Saturday. They won both games, uh, Friday and Saturday. But a team that, that as Mike Olson uh, said on, on the broadcast, the, the men's basketball play-by-play or color commentator, he said, this, this team's scary good. And I think, you know, it's it, not just our, it's not just Dixie State that, that's like that throughout the country, but this is a Dixie State team that compete. If they play like that, they can compete with anybody in the country. And uh, right now, uh, through through eight games, I think deserving of that top 10 record. And it's incredible to see where this team is when not that long ago we were going, okay, camp's opening. Who's this team going to be? Yeah, yeah, no doubt about it. And, and you go back. You mentioned that Black Hill State game last year. It was a 91-70 final last year against Black Hill State. It was in, uh, it was on the road against Black Hill State, and they lost by 21. And you, like you mentioned, uh, the Yellow Jackets wiped the floor with Dixie State last year, and 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 Dixie State got their revenge this year with a 76-54 victory over a team coming into the game was averaging 77 points per game, 77 points per game. Dixie State held them to 54. 23 points under their season average. And, uh, I mean, they, they were just tremendous. They put the clamps down defensively. They were scoring on offense just about whenever they wanted to. Uh, Jack Pagenkoff was sensational. Uh, 23 points, 6 assists, 6 rebounds. The typical Jack Pagenkoff game that you've come to come to know and love. Uh, obviously put in 23 points, which is a season high for him. And uh, he, he filled up the stat sheet once again. Um, against South Dakota Mines, he had 19 points. Uh, and, and between the two games... He was 15 of 26 from the field, including 7 of 9 from 3. And and he just could not be stopped the entire weekend. And uh, he, he was really tremendous for Dixie State, averaging 12 and a half, 7 and 7 on the season. And he's been one of the big keys for Dixie State in their 8-0 start and the number 9 ranked team in the country. Here are some, here are some numbers. Here are some. Uh, well, in fact, we'll do this. We'll do this I mean, we're not on uh, CEC TV today, so we don't have the graphic. But we'll go ahead and make this our Rock Canyon Bank by the numbers feature for this week. In the two games between uh, South Dakota School of Mines and uh, against Black Hills State, Dixie State shot a combined 17 of 32 better than 50% from three, and they held Black Hill State to 38% shooting and 29% from three. They were unbelievable. That's, that's good, right? That's amazing. 17 of 32 from three is better than 50%. If you can shoot better than 50% on any number of threes, I don't care if you take five or 50 a game, if you can shoot more, better than 50%, uh, you're going to come out and, and, and have a successful, uh, a, success, a successful game. And you mentioned this could be a scary team. Let me give you one other stat. They did all this in the last two games, and Frank Stain scored two points. Frank Stain combined, 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 scored two points combined in the game. Coming into the game, he was averaging 15 points per game before these last two games. If you have Jack Pagenkoff, who continues to score the way he is at 12 and a half points per game, Schofield as well, he's averaging pretty close to 20 points per game. If you can get Stain back to 15 points a game, and you've got a three-headed monster there. Uh, in scoring. The, it's about 45 points per game between the three of them. Josh Newbold also is right there at eight eight and a half points a game. And uh, Dason Youngblood is scoring 10 points a game. So you have almost five starters in, you know, obviously you your five starters almost averaging in double figures. So you mentioned it's a scary team. If they can continue to do what they've been doing and Payton Kaufman to continue to score and Frank Stain uh, kind of gets out of this little mini stump that he's been in the last two games, watch out because they're going to be able to score a lot, and if they play defense like they did against Black Hill State, they can be very, very tough to beat. Yeah, the, those three, and, and I feel like, and you talked about Hunter Schofield as well, but but I feel like, and he's been scoring and filling up the stat sheet, but it, it was Jack Pagenkoff and it was Hunter Schofield over the over that weekend that really took the bull by the horns and 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 got things done. And you're starting to see uh, Hunter. He's, he scored it well early, and he's been and he's been doing he's been double figures the whole season. But you're starting to see a level of confidence there as he's made the transition from Salt Lake Community College and made the transition from from junior college to to NCAA Division Two because yeah, it might not be Division One 
yet, but there's a difference. There's a difference in 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 speed, in in talent. There's you know there there's a difference, and it schemes maybe are different, and and he's starting to figure it out, and and he's very comfortable in the paint, and and he's starting to get better defensively as well. And, and this is a Dixie State team that's starting to rebound the ball better, and and that is so key to this Trailblazer team. You look at Jack Pagenkoff, and he's liable to go for close to a triple double every night. He's uh, he he's right up there. Uh, let, let's pull up the stats. If you, if you click that averages button, Martin Martin's producing for us. Click the button that says averages right now. So so Jack Pagenkoff's twelve points 12 and per half, game, seven and seven. Twelve and a half, seven and seven, and his Almost rebounds eight. and his rebounds are down a little bit. He was up around nine, and and, and you know what he loves to do? We had him on the show uh, in early in this basketball season uh, on long rebounds. He loves to grab the ball and go, and that's exactly what Coach Judkins wants him to do. They want they want to get up the floor and they want to be successful as as they're able to uh to to get up and and you know if if they can get up and, and get a transition bucket without setting in half court offense i mean that that that's ideal uh, obviously if the defense is there they'll pull it back out they'll find they'll find the shot what i have enjoyed seeing this trailblazer team do is they, they're much better defensively forcing turnovers and they're, they're taking care of the ball and then on top of that they're being they're being patient they're sharing the ball uh, you know as a team really helping each other out as a team as you look at those numbers just under 20 assists per game right now as a team and getting everybody involved and and whether it's a three point shot or a layup or a 10 foot jumper in the paint if it's there that they'll take it and that's what I love about this team right now that you know in, in basketball right now it seems like either you want a dunk or you want a three and if you can't get one of those things you're not going to take it this team is not like that team is the star they're going to share the ball and and if you leave me open at the free throw line i'm gonna make you pay and that's exactly what they're doing yeah i mean you know they can they can beat you in a ton of different ways right now uh they're shooting 48 percent from the field as a team and 38 percent from the from the three-point line as a team i mean you know they're obviously we've talked about it a few times both on the air and off the air that they're shooting more threes as a team than we've ever seen a John Judkins coach team shoot in the past. And they're making them at a high, at a high rate. Like I mentioned, 38% as a team. And that's remarkable. If you can shoot anywhere over 35% as a team from three and close to 50% from the field as a team, uh, you are, you are really clicking on all cylinders. And like I mentioned, that's been with a few games where you haven't had production from Frank Stain and you haven't had the, the scoring like you have in the two previous games from Jack Pagenkoff. And, you know, before these last two games, he was averaging, you know, eight, nine points per game. And, and now with just the two games of scoring, uh, you know, in double figures and then 19 and 23, he's now up over, over 12 and a half points per game now. So if you can continue to get that kind of scoring from, from Jack Pagenkoff plus the, the scoring you had from Frank Stain before, I mean, is now and especially with shooting the high percentages you are from the field and from three, um, you're going to be very, very tough to beat, especially if you can be as good defensively as Dixie State has been. And, uh, you know, like we mentioned, it just, you know, it, it just goes to show how good of a coach John Judkins is because no matter who he puts on the floor, he can come up with a scheme uh, to where it'll utilize his personnel to the best of their abilities. And he's done it once again. And, and even though the question marks that we had coming into the season, some of those may still exist. But through the first eight games of the season, you wouldn't know that they didn't have four of their top five, you know, high scores from last season's team not return, uh, whether to graduation or just electing not to come back to play for the program incredible start for this men's basketball team and now they get to take the show on the road uh as you take a look at at the schedule they'll be at new mexico highlands friday night and then they will be at csu pueblo saturday night in what will be their first true road games of the season they've been playing neutral site games up at salt lake city for a couple of weeks and this will be a tough stretch because you've got conference games in New Mexico Highlands and CSU Pueblo. And then on December 20th, you make uh, the long trip up to Monmouth, Oregon for a single game at Western Oregon. And uh, from what I've seen, Western Oregon maybe maybe not be as good as, as they have in the past, but they're always a good team. And that will be a tough, tough uh, game on the road. So this three-game stretch will be a very telling and a good measuring stick to see uh, where this team is as you go out on the road for the first time this 
season. And against New Mexico Highlands, who, yes. who Dixie State owes some payback. A little, little unfinished business. They came in last season to, Bur- to Burns Arena in the Armac tournament and, and, and controlled Dixie State for the entirety of that game. And I think hopefully revenge will be on the Trailblazers' mind yeah. as they head into Las Vegas, New Mexico. Yeah, it's going to be a... Uh, it's going to be up to Jack Pagankoff, Andre Wilson, Cameron Chatwin, these guys that are back that experienced that game to say, get in the locker room and say, listen, they, they came in and they pushed us around on our own floor and that doesn't fly with us. And it's a so good, we got to, it, it, so we got to go in and, and, and take care of business. And it's a good Highlands team as yeah, well. Seven they, and one. They're, they're no, really score it. They're no push really over. score it. No doubt about it. So we'll keep you updated on that. We'll have the, all the recap and, and some thoughts on that next week r- right here on Trailblazer Weekly, but we've got to take a break. We're going to the football field now. We mentioned earlier in the show, head coach, uh, not head coach, defensive coordinator Tyler Allman of the Dixie State football team. Uh, a wonderful opportunity to be part of the AFCA 35 under 35 coaches uh, leadership institute at the AFCA convention in January in Nashville, Tennessee. It was announced just a couple of days ago that he was selected to that committee. So we've got to take a break. We'll take a time out when we come back. He will join us right here in studio to uh, talk about this year's defense and then what that honor to be part of that committee and part of that institute means to him. That's coming up next on Trailblazer Weekly. Welcome back inside the Radio Dixie 91.3 FM Studios, Trailblazer Weekly. Marches on on a Wednesday afternoon. Carrick Segmiller and Drayson Ball with you. Uh, radio only this week is CEC TV. Uh, getting a little break from us. Getting some other work in. They're down in Las Vegas working some other jobs. We appreciate all they do. And uh, But excited to still be on the, on the air here on Radio Dixie 91.3 FM. Too much to talk about to step away from the show uh, for this week and for next week also. We just couldn't do it because we got the, the Christmas break coming up. We'll miss a show or two uh, in that time stretch. So we couldn't afford to miss this week and next. Too much good stuff going on inside Dixie State Athletics. And one of those things, as uh, you already know, the Trailblazer are football squad, 8-3 and three overall record this year, 7-3 and three in the RMAC. Uh, the winningest season in the history of the Division II era for the Trailblazers. A big part of that was how good the defense was game in and game out. Today we've got... Defensive coordinator Tyler Allman joining us on the show. We'll chat a little bit about that season, but coach, really want to first congratulate you and uh, and ask you about the the AFCA, the American Football Coaches Association, the the 2020 Coaches Leadership Institute, 35 under 35. Congratulations on your selection to this this institute, this committee, if you will. First off, congrats. Second off, take us through uh, the process getting this. Uh, application complete, what it entailed, and <clears throat> what is so special about being part of this institute for this committee. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me here, too. And uh, yeah, I was, I was uh, pleasantly shocked. I think it's a, you know, really a reflection, uh, um, a reflection of our team and our players and all the hard work they put into it. And just fortunate enough to uh, be uh, accepted into the Leadership uh, Institute. It's uh, the AFCA's, our coaches association uh, for all American football coaches and uh, college, professional, high school. And so uh, I was just, just really lucky. Uh, the application process, I had done a, uh, a article a while back when I was a linebacker coach at Sacramento State uh, on linebacker play and teaching strategy in, in, in American football. And I uh, just kind of kept that. I wrote it for a publication before, kept that, and then that's what you know they needed for the application. So I just kind of edited it uh, a little bit and, and uh, submitted that with a resume and was fortunate enough to uh, be selected. There's there's 35 coaches that are under 35 you know years of age, and that's a really good uh, um, you know deal that they put on there in, in Nashville this year uh, with a lot of other coaches that you know older coaches that. Uh, come head coaches that you know come and talk about different topics and lectures and stuff like that. So really excited to uh, be selected and, and represent Dixie State. Well, as you go through, and, and for you all of you listening out there, I just want you to understand truly how big of a deal this is. As you go through and you look at some of the other schools that uh, other coaches were selected from, you got San Diego State, you've got uh, North Dakota State. You've got uh, Washington State. I mean, they're, they're big-time teams at the FBS and the FCS level. Of course, there's some NAIA schools. There's some uh, high school head coaches on that list as well. Uh, coach, you were the only school selected or only coach selected from from the RMAC. Uh, what does this mean 
to you personally and and to this football team going forward and what kind of experience will you gain from from being part of this this institute and being able to be uh, a big part of that AFCA convention next month yeah I think it's just a, a big uh you know, a uh, way to go learn some some new things, be able to talk about, you know, rules uh, that uh, surround our sport, you know, different recruiting strategies. I'm sure they'll talk about all that stuff and just the professionalism of, you know, of coaching and, and maybe bring back some of those ideas and share them with our staff. Uh, I think it's huge. But I think any time that you get, you get the opportunity to, you know, go learn and learn from other people and, and uh, you know, kind of best teaching strategy or coaching strategies and stuff like that. I think uh, definitely improves who you are as personally. You know, who I am as a coach, and also you know, will improve our program hopefully with some of the things that that uh, you learn. Coach, uh, you mentioned you had to submit an article that you'd written uh, in the past, and it wasn't just any small little article. Sixteen hundred words is, is no yeah. uh, no short article. It certainly uh, took some time to write that, and certainly edited and get it submitted. Not only that, there's all sorts of other requirements. You have to be obviously under thirty five. You have to be a full time or assistant head coach and a, at an NCAA, NCAA Division two level, among other things. What now? Like, what what's next? I mean, obviously you got selected to be in the program. I understand that there's kind of a, a an institute that you get to go to for a kind of a one day seminar. Where it's you get to learn um, different things as far as um, responsibilities, progression, you know, kind of all that kind of stuff. What does that entail? What do you know about that? And what kind of is the next step for you now that you've been selected? Yeah, they, they haven't given us an itinerary yet, but they kind of just mentioned that, you know, we're, I'm flying out to Nashville. I think it's 11th. Um, just get off the road recruiting and then go right back out. So, but uh, my wife's happy about that. But, uh, and then it's a it's a one day deal that there the, the convention is about four days long but uh, the first day that we're there they're going to have different you know lecturers come in and talk to us the 35 coaches that, that have been selected and so I think it, you know probably touch on a lot of different topics um, you know regarding the sport of football regarding coaching and you know rules and recruiting and all that kind of stuff and so I don't know exactly what it entails but I know there's a lot of different lecturers that come by I know a lot of current head coaches I think the coach at uh, uh, Louisiana um, uh, Lafayette is coming in to speak. He's kind of reached out a little bit, and and so there's other other head coaches and just professionals. I think that they have him come and talk to us, and so I'm really excited about that. And just anytime that you know, again, that you get out of you know the, the people that you see every day and maybe learn something new is is just absolutely huge, you know, to your development and to the development of our of our guys too. So I'm hoping that I can bring them something back, you know, that will make them better and make them better players, better people and better students and stuff like that. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because the next question I was going to ask was about, you know, you obviously getting selected is, is a great honor, but now you get to go and learn and rub shoulders and kind of get instructed by other guys at the FCS and the F FBS and the Division One level, basically, that you can go and get all kinds of knowledge and bring back to your program that that is now transitioning into Division One. How much do you think that will help as you kind of prepare um, to go into Division One? That you can go ask kind of Division One coaches, like, "Hey, what you know, things should I expect, or, or what uh, you know, th things should I teach my kids? How how is that going to help your program as you transition into Division One?" Yeah, absolutely. Just being able to ask those questions and you know, networking is is huge to your development as a coach. You know, you got to be able to have people that you can kind of lean on, and if you have a question or if a guy's doing a technique, you know, that you heard about or we're able to talk and discuss with them and be able to call them up and say, hey, how are you teaching this? Or, you know, what are you guys doing for, you know, recruiting or, you know, what's this rule ed education? Just all kinds of stuff like that. I think it's, it's huge to have a big network. And then any time that you can professionally develop, I mean, that's, you know, nobody has the answers. I know I'm, I'm, I got a lot of room for improvement. And so that's something that, you know, kind of intrigued me to apply to this is just, the opportunity for growth, you know, I think uh, is just huge. I know I need to, to, to grow, continue to grow as a coach, especially as we enter Division One and competition, you know, raises and stuff like that. So hopefully going out there, there'll be some things, you know, schematically maybe we take back or just, you know, from a recruiting advantage, things, things that guys are doing, recruiting, um, you know, things that we can do uh, and take back and maybe I can share with, with our staff. I think it's huge. Chatting with Dixie State football defensive coordinator Tyler Allman here on Trailblazer Weekly on this Wednesday afternoon. Of course, Coach Allman recently selected to the AFCA 2020 35 under 35 Coaches Leadership Institute. A, a great honor for him and for this football program. And, and congratulations to you, Coach, about that. One thing we haven't been able to chat with you about since the season ended was uh, the season itself. Yeah. I mean, 8-3. and three. Let's talk about that. 
for a minute in, in a defense that uh, I, I think we can safely say, as we noted in the in the press release on the website the other day, uh, the most efficient season in the D2 era for the Sixty State defense. You only give up 22 points per game, uh, under 350 yards per game. You give up the fewest amount of touchdowns, uh, program record 40 sacks. Uh, how would you recap, you know, in just a couple of minutes, th- this defense's performance and how they responded to everything that maybe you guys changed up going into this year, you know, new coaching staff. How would you recap their performance and, and everything that they did out there for you guys on the field this year? Oh, I'm just incredibly proud of the, the the guys, the players, you know, for grinding through coaching change, you know, and coming in with an open heart, you know, and, and some, you know, techniques might have been different or coaching styles, you know, standards you know, might have been different and they just totally accepted it, uh, you know, with open arms and, and uh, we're, we're just phenomenal. All of our guys and our coaching staff did a great job too. Uh, Loni Fangupo, uh, Misi Tupe, and Mike Smith uh, just did a phenomenal job coaching their guys, hold them to a standard, uh, you know, of excellence. I think we can build off of. I think I don't think we're anywhere near where we want to be, um, you know, but I think we're we're going the right direction. We had a, a lot of young guys, you know, we, that are, that are coming back. That's the, that's the beautiful thing about it is. Next year, we're going to have a lot of guys. We're going to miss Alex Lilliard, Aaron Simpson, JT Anderson, a couple of those guys that uh, that are going to graduate, you know, but but I think most of the guys are coming back, and it's it's something that we can just continue to have consistency and teach them the same way that we've been te- teaching them and some of the similar techniques and, and, and uh, schematics and all that kind of stuff. So really excited uh, for the future and, and just really proud of our guys on the work I th- they, put, they put in. Of course, season's over now, so now we can finally think uh, ahead to this Division One thing without feeling like we're overlooking uh, any games. Uh, what's kind of been the the reaction to the coaching staff? You've hit the ground running. You're at recruiting. You're, you're busy as all as all get out. You just mentioned that for this this AFCA Coaches Institute, you're going to get back from the road recruiting and then head right back out to Nashville for a day or two. Uh, what, what's it been like? As a staff, as you guys have met and, and and got this recruiting season underway, yeah, it's just been you know you, you get uh, get done with the season and then it just happens so quick that you're back on the road, you know, and just the the another grind continues, it's, which is awesome, you know, it's it's uh, a lot better than not picking your team, you know, not not getting out there and getting to sit in homes and stuff like that. And so uh, I think just going to the transition to Division One, obviously we got to get out and recruit and and uh, we got to get some guys in here. You know, with uh, you know some Division One caliber players, which I think we got a ton of them guys on our on our team right now that are that were Division One caliber players and ended up on a Division Two team, and so I think just going to find and, and plug some holes. You know, we got a couple holes that graduation or you know attrition has left us, and so we got to get a couple mid year guys, and uh, we got a you know recruiting visit this this weekend. We got a couple guys coming in, and so hopefully uh, we can sign some next week, and then uh, and then January hit it and really get the you know the high school kids in here that. You know, fit that that uh, that caliber of player and work ethic and student. You know uh, that that we're looking for and that Coach Peterson's kind of uh, providing that vision for. Coach, how much uh, you know, obviously in the recruiting season? How much does the next season's schedule play into the guys you recruit, or it does it at all? I mean, do you do you look forward and say, well, let's recruit a guy that's going to help us beat SUU next year, or help us beat you know one of your teams on your schedule? Do you look at guys like that, or do you just look at these are good guys that are going to help our team win regardless of who we're playing? I mean, if, if SUU has a, a big left tackle, but you want to recruit a, a, a big guy that can get around him, yeah. does that play a factor, or is it just let's go try to get the best guys that are good team guys that, that help our program win. Yeah, that's a good question. I just, me and Paul actually just had a conversation about this. When you're in a conference, it's really easy because you kind of know the style of play that you're gonna have. you're gonna face a spread team. You know, eight out of ten games or whatever. And us being independent, it's kind of hard because we're gonna go face a Missouri Valley team that's gonna line up in 21. You know, with a fullback and and two tight ends and you know try to run down our throat. And then the next week we're gonna go play. You know, Eastern Washington or whoever Sac State. You know, that's gonna be 10 personnel, four wide receivers, and try to throw it all over us. So it's kind of unique. I mean, we're looking for just good players. You know, I think one thing that uh, we're trying to, you know, get better at is is, uh, is recruiting length. 
you know, longer players that are unfinished products that you can get into weight room, add the weight that maybe the FBS schools are looking over them a little bit because they're a little slim. You know, good good example of that a guy on our team is Screech. You know, Dylan Hendrickson is a guy that that was a safety I think or a corner at uh, at Pine View. And, uh, you know, probably wasn't maybe as athletic for uh, to be a corner at Division One level and has gained like 40 or 50 pounds here and I think led our team in sacks and he's going to be really a, a stud for us the next couple of years. So those are the type of guys that we're, we're looking for. And uh, FCS Division Two, I think that's the guys that you got to recruit are unfinished products. So you're not going to go out there and find a 6'5", 285-pound kid that, you know, can run and, and all that stuff. Those those guys are going to Alabama, you know. we got to find the kid that might be might, might need to gain 40 pounds to be that, you know, and all that stuff. So uh, I think we're looking for good players, but it definitely the independent thing kind of, you know, throws throws a curveball at us too because we don't really don't know who we're going to be playing in three years. Yeah, I mean that's 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 a great answer. Obviously, with uh, with with going to Division One, I. I didn't even think about going independent. I didn't. Yeah. I didn't. Yeah, that's a that's a obviously a, a good key, key component. Have to let you let you go in here and just spin a minute, but uh, can't let you go without asking you about the top ten play that we had yeah. uh, of the season. I mean, obviously, it was players on your defense that that was part of that top ten play. Um, what was what was kind of your reaction right after it happened, and what uh, I mean, do you go up to your player and say nice play or do you go up and say don't ever do that again because you know it's a risky play in, in certain situations but I mean what was kind of just your reaction and kind of uh, how you responded to your team and your defense doing that play I was I was just relieved that we were off the field <laughs> the game was finally over so I think uh, you know they they got the ball back and you never know you know you're just a nervous wreck and so uh, we I think it was third down or maybe it was fourth down when they when we intercepted that ball we had two man cover uh, you know called and we're just trying to get off the field and Cajun made a, just an unbelievable play Loney joked with the team he, on the team meeting he said we practice that every day you know <laughs> we don't we, we never practice that but he just made a instinctual play and JT was there to, to you know get it and then and then you guys did a great job of pub, you know pubbing that out. Uh, that that evening and and, uh, and getting it out there on social media and stuff and so it just kind of took off and but Cajuns a, you know that's a great story of the guys that we had on our team I mean you look at our especially on defense I don't know uh, you know how many guys that that we had that just we had injury like every team has we had guys you know that that uh, banged up here and there and the next guy you know stepped up and so Cajun is a guy that didn't have a huge role in our defense this year. But made probably the best play that, that we made this this whole season, and so uh, very you know proud of him. Get get him back for another couple of years too, and and uh, just really excited. It was an amazing play. Of course, we had him on our show uh, right after that, and you're not going to find a more humble, disrespectful kid, no doubt, a, as well. So, yeah. what well, was certainly incredible, and we have to give just a shout out to Trailblazer Nation, another one for that, because yeah, we got it posted online, but Trailblazer Nation took it and ran with it, and that play was seen uh, through everything we posted through the stuff that that ESPN put on their sports center Instagram yeah. and, and Twitter it was seen millions of times as, and, we, and as we go out recruiting every kid you know talks about they saw that on, on yeah. the sports center so it's like Dixie State there's that's association you know when it, it just was incredible that night Jason and I were texting back and forth that night waiting and, and watching and see if it was coming and, and we're texting back and forth during the top 10 okay it's not 10 yeah. it's not nine it's not eight it's not five. Like it's got to be in here somewhere. Yeah. It's not number two, so that means number one. And boom, number one. There, there it is. And that what a night. I, mean, I, I had a hard time going to sleep that night just from the the adrenaline of it all, and, and it was spectacular to see the amazing play and to see. Um, Dixie State highlighted, and then also our CEC TV crew highlighted for the hard work they do and, no and got, getting that video. And I think it was just fun to see. It comes on, and you see the big Dixie State logo right in the middle of the field. Yeah. For me, that That's, was one yeah, of the cool things huge. that you just got to see Dixie's logo right there in the middle of the field. Yeah. Well, Coach, we appreciate you uh, stopping by the studio and taking time out of your busy schedule because uh, and I say that it seems like to almost everybody that comes on the show because everybody is busy. But I know that today was kind of a, a one day passing back through town before you you hit the Las Vegas to Salt Lake, <laughs> hit the road again. Yeah. So thanks for thanks for stopping by and 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 taking some time and you know go find some dudes and we look forward to you know hopefully chatting with you probably on signing day. I think we're looking uh, in in February. We're looking forward to doing a whole 
signing day special yeah. with, you know, Coach Peterson and, and hopefully you and, and some of the other offensive coaches and defensive coaches and, and just talking up these guys that you're able to bring in. And before we know it, we'll be talking spring ball again. And, and yep. before we know it, we'll be in fall camp and, and ready to go head up to SUU on September 5th. Or, yep. So Awesome. Thanks Appreciate for stopping you guys. by. We got to take a break. We got much more Trailblazer Weekly coming at you. The Trailblazer basketball teams uh, are in action. We'll continue to break that down on the other side of this timeout. Welcome back inside Trailblazer Weekly on a Wednesday afternoon. Eric Segmiller, Drayson Ball with you. Mark Kelly hanging out in the Radio Dixie 91.3 FM studio. Producing uh, just radio only show today, Radio Dixie 91.3 FM, and we're in the last segment of the show. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for making us part of your day on this uh, this Wednesday afternoon as we approach and, and continue closer to to Christmas and, and, and New Year's Day and and bowl season and it's coming. You got your Christmas shopping done? I do. I yeah. do. Uh, other than one one little thing for 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 someone. For me? I don't know. For maybe, Martin? Maybe. Maybe for Martin. Getting Martin a, a new set of headphones, some beats? Maybe. We'll okay. See. Women's basketball team is 6-3, and 1-2 and two in the RMAC, and I don't think I can overstate the importance of uh, of the victory on Saturday over, over Black Hill State. Uh, there was a time in that game where we were all kind of looking at it thinking, man, they're in some trouble, but uh, they rallied, got the win, and... Uh, and a six and three start, obviously not quite where you want to be, but that this is a, a young team. This is a team with a lot of new players, and and for the most part, still through nine games, still trying to figure out how exactly to play uh, alongside some of those teammates. They're still figuring out some of those rotations. They're still figuring out who's most comfortable handling the ball, who gets us into the offense best, who's. Uh, you know who's best on defense. They're they're still figuring these things out, and they're six and three, and a huge win on Saturday over Black Hill State, seventy one sixty five, in a game that, that they trailed late, and, and made a run in the second half to to win that game. In a game that in the first half really felt like Black Hill State controlled that game, and the Trailblazers were able to come back, outscoring Black Hill State twenty one to fifteen in the third, and twenty three to seventeen in the fourth quarter. And and we're just gonna we're just gonna say it uh, right now. We're not gonna wait any longer. Deshka Olson was was the X factor. Fourteen points in thirteen minutes. Five of five from the field, including four of four from three point land. Had a couple of rebounds as well. And Deshka's a player who you know a couple of years ago signed at the mid year uh, and then just practiced in the spring last year. Had some injuries hampering her. She wasn't able to play at all last year, and and, and now this year able to see her first time on the floor at Dixie State and this was her breakout game and, and I expect more you know maybe not perfect from the field but I expect to see a lot more of those three-point shots going through just like they did uh Saturday night as she was in in, in a six-point win she's she's the x-factor and, and was huge. Kesley Stevenson hit three threes in the game as well. She had 12 points. Allie Franks had 10 points. London Pavlika has been spectacular uh, in the last couple of games. But uh, if it weren't for Jessica Olsen stepping up and hitting those shots, it's a, it's a totally different outcome. But that's what you love about this team is that someone different stepping up night in and, and night out. And, and they have the ability to, to do so. So th- this team is in a good spot. They go on the road for the first time. And, and you know, going on the road can can really be you know a lot of times you look at a road trip as as kind of you know it's going to be long it's going to be tough we're going to be tired but a lot of that team bonding and and a lot of camaraderie comes from those road trips and the Trailblazers opened on the road in Texas but then over the last seven games have not been on the road they took a they took a quick trip up to the Logan for an exhibition at Utah State but other than that regular season play they haven't been on the road since the eighth and ninth of November. So it's been over a month in regular season play, and and I fully expect them to go on the road and have success this weekend, and to continue building the the camaraderie and and to continue to to figure this thing out. And and Coach Gustin is, you know, talks and is and is willing to still say that this is one of the most talented teams he's ever had and ever coached, and 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 especially here at Dixie State, and 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 I'm with him, I and I see it, and you just got to put it all together. 
and 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 they will be able to do that. It's still early, one and two in conference play. Plenty of time to get this thing going, and uh, you know, look out because when they get this all the way figured out, going to be a tough team to beat. Oh yeah, for sure. And, and going back to that, you know, Black Hill State game, it's going to be, you know, we're going to look back in the season. That's going to be remembered as the Deshka Olson game for sure. Uh, like you mentioned, you know, the fourteen points, perfect from the field, four threes. Uh, she was she was the spark that the Trailblazers needed late in that game. Don't forget, in that game, they were trailing by 11 points at one point uh, late in the second quarter. They went on a, on a mini 7-0 run there near the end of the quarter. They did give up a bucket right before halftime. Uh, but for all intents and purposes, got you know the 11-point lead down to four points. Um, and, and really kind of just that was their momentum they needed uh, carrying themselves into the second half. And then the Desh Golson part of it was, was really spectacular. Um, if you remember... With about three and a half minutes to play in the third quarter, Dixie State was down six points, and Black Hill State had a lot of momentum. And in the next, the over the next thirty or the, over the next ninety seconds, this is what took place for Dixie State from going down six. They went to up five. They went on an eleven zero run uh, within ninety seconds, and this is and this is what happened: three pointer by Kesley Stevens, three pointer by Deshka Olson. A layup by Ashley Greenwood, and then another three pointer from 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 Desh Olson, and uh, so she had two threes in in a in a minute long span, and Dixie State went from being down six to being up five in eleven zero run, which really was was what they needed to get kind of over the hump and get the momentum back in that game, and 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 she was spectacular. Lennon Pavlika, like we mentioned, she was phenomenal against Black Hills State or about uh, against South Dakota Mines, thirteen points, six assists, five steals. Four rebounds. Um, she provided provided a huge spark off the bench. Thirty five minutes off the bench, and uh, she got the start the next day. And uh, she, she played very very well. Um, eight points, seven rebounds, five assists, and two blocks. So she's just been filling up the stat sheet uh, whenever she gets playing time, whenever she gets minutes, and 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 she's really been a huge spark for the sixty eight team. But uh, one of the things you mentioned, you know, like you mentioned, is is they're a very talented team, and I think. They are kind of learning how to play with one another, and uh, you know I think they're they're going to be able to kind of figure this this thing out. And, and the good news for them right now, I mean, six and three start is great. The schedule kind of lightens up a little bit, even though you're playing on the road for the next two weeks. The schedule does lighten up just a little bit over the next uh, this upcoming road trip. They play New Mexico Highlands, CSU Pueblo. They have a non-conference exhibition game on December 30th against Yellowstone Christian. But then you're back home against UCCS, Colorado School of Mines. All four of those uh, games that actually count, not counting the exhibition, all four of them are against teams that are right now under 500. And so uh, you got a chance right now to really make a run and uh, and move up in those RMAC standings at, at, at kind of a point in the season where, you know, if you, if you make four or five wins in a row, uh, you're going to put yourself in a good situation for the end of the year. Yeah, the, the New Mexico Highlands game, the, the, the Cowgirls right now only averaging 58.9 points per game, giving up almost 75 points per game. You know, Trailblazers should have an opportunity to go have success there. And of, and of course, CSU Pueblo, you know, a team that uh, they should be motivated to beat after, you know, blowing a, a what was a 10 point lead late in the game here at home last year and then falling 73 uh, 70. It will be a, a good opportunity to get out on the road. I, I don't know if I said this already, but to get out and, and finals are over, you get out on the road and all you're thinking about is, is basketball. You go and, and you play the game that you love. And, uh, and I'm, I'm excited to see how they were able to do this weekend and, and fully expect them to come back with a pair of wins in, in their back pocket. I, I, a couple other players that I, I think you have to mention uh, still at this point and, and, Speaking of players that are going to continue to get better, uh, Chesney Stevens is, is one for me. She's averaging seven points per game, uh, seven rebounds per game as well, and 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 the points are only going to go up. She's getting a lot of good looks in, inside, and eventually she's going to get to a point where she's finishing at, at the basket, and and you know would not be shocked by the end of the season to see her averaging close to to a triple double, and and she's going to be key uh, for this team in, in the rebounding department a, as well. Right now, the Trailblazers out-rebounding teams, 41.9 rebounds to 36.4 rebounds, and, and that's key for the for this team. We've seen them when they've gotten, the times where they've gotten into trouble, uh, the Westminster game, when they couldn't get a rebound late, uh, you even saw it against South Dakota Mines a, a little bit. You've got to to focus on those little things and, and, and rebound, and I know that they're working on it, and, and they'll be 
uh, they'll be just fine. They're too talented not to be. Uh, Ashley Greenwood is another player that's going to continue to get to get better. As as Coach Gustin stated when he was on our show uh, last week, uh, you know this is a this is a player who didn't play a lot at at BYU registered year, didn't play a lot last year, and now is getting out of the floor. So this season is really her first season of collegiate basketball and experiencing that, you know, that full different speed and, and different things like that. And she, she's been practicing, but it, it, it it's hard to simulate a, a game environment. So she she's figuring things out on the fly and, and she is too talented not to be a contributor to, to this team. And, and right now she's averaging eight, eight points per game. She's grabbing three rebounds per game, dishing out two and a half assists per game. Uh, you know, and she's not, Shooting great from the, you know, she is. She's up over 40% from the field now, uh, 28% from three, 70% from the free throw line. She, she's getting better and and better, and and she will be a big part of this team as it continues to go on through through the season. Uh, Maddie Loftus is one who, you know, they've missed some of that three-point shooting that we saw a couple of weeks ago, you know, kind of cooled off a little bit, but, but she's right there. There's so many different players on this women's basketball team that that can contribute and that will contribute. Brianna Moyai came in and and gave some big minutes in in those games this weekend, and then uh, always be on the lookout for the freshman Brianna Gillen, who can do it all, can play really any position on the floor, can bring the ball up and play the one, can go down and post up and play the four, and and she's just a freshman, so she will continue to be a big big contributor and and the trailblazers want to make a splash on this trip and uh, it, it's their last chance before the exhibition against yellowstone christian to really to make that statement and they're looking to make that statement and this is an opportunity to go out on the road to get a couple of wins and, and to come back and, and be ready for the break and say look we're you know could be possibly eight and three uh back above 500 at three and two in the armac and and be competing for the the RMAC tournament and and try to make some noise. Yeah, and 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 you know, let's not make it sound like it's 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 doom and gloom. I mean, oh, you know, we not at all. We, yeah. we, we, we hope that's not been been coming across because I mean, the Dixie State, you know, this has been their best start to a season since you have to for go a long back time. all the way back yeah. to 2010, 2011. They started 10 and 0 and then eventually got out to 19 and 1. And so this is their best start since for basically a decade. And so the fact that I think that we're we're uh, cautiously um, well, not cautiously, but we're approaching this as kind of like a, hey, they got to kind of get it together. It's because we have such high expectations for this team and we know what they can be. And we just want to hope they reach it as fast as possible because they know we know that they can be, be so successful. And so obviously it's a team that that we have a lot of high expectations for. And I don't know, at least in the past, you know, five, six, seven, eight, nine years, even you may not have had that kind of expectation coming into a season with a team yeah. that that right now could could compete for an arm championship. And, 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 I, and I think that's the difference. Right, you look at it, and you you went into the season. You could see how talented they were, and there was you know there was some expectation, and they're still there. They're meeting expectations. There, you look at the two conference losses, and it's a combined six points in the two conference losses. Four point loss to Westminster, which is a very good team. They're and they're veteran. Coach Gustin is is has the first thing he says. They're they're veteran players that have experience, and you know the Trailblazers are young, they, and and they're going to continue to grow, and they will be. Just fine. So and the four even points, against, yeah. Even against South Dakota Mines, which yeah. was a two-point game, and you had the chance to win that on three separate occasions in the last yeah, couple it, of minutes of fourth quarter you, and overtime. You had an Ali Frank's three-pointer that was on wide line, open, and it was wide open. It was online, and it it just it was one of those not meant to be. Hit and it would have won the game. Hit the back. Sometimes that that shot hits the back iron and and goes in. Sometimes it caroms off, and this one happened to to carom off. I mean, so th- this team there. They're one and two in conference. They're under five hundred in conference right now. But come see me in a couple of weeks, and and they're they're just fine. Yeah, yeah, they'll be just fine. I'm not worried about it. And like I said, the schedule gets really easy for the next uh, next two three weeks, and I, I fully expect them to take advantage of some teams right now that are struggling in the RMAC. Trailblazers, men's women's basketball teams on the road. That's the we're to the point in the year now. That's it. They're on the road at, at New Mexico Highlands Friday. Women's game, 5.30. Men's game, 7.30. CSU Pueblo Saturday. Again, 5.30, 7.30 doubleheader there. And uh, and then that's it. So that will do it 
for the show today. Keep an eye on DixieStateAthletics.com and on uh, at Dixie Athletics on Twitter for all the the updates throughout the weekend to, to stay uh, up to date on what's going on with those basketball teams. We will be right back at this next week here on Radio Dixie 91.3 FM. Uh, Carrick Segmiller, Drayson Ball hanging out with you on a Wednesday afternoon. We'll see you next week. Go Trailblazers!